much uh, for participating. Uh, we would like to make this uh, an interactive broadcast with discussion from participants, so we uh, encourage you to use the chat pod, uh, which is located on the left hand of the screen, to type your questions and comments to the panel. Uh, please, if you lose audio or, visit or video, uh, exit the webinar, close out of your browser, launch your browser, and log back into the show. If the problem continues, please restart your computer. At the end of the show, there will be a web link to a SAGE's survey. We encourage you to take the survey in order for us to get to know you uh, and to make our upcoming events even better. This is being recorded and will be available to view online at www.sages.org within the next two uh, weeks. I would certainly like to thank all of uh, the, the panel that you'll be hearing from, Dr. Rajan Sudan from Duke, Dr. Timothy Kawada from Carolina's Medical Center, Dr. Demetrius Stefanidis from Carolina's Medical Center, and Dr. Stacy Brethauer from Cleveland Clinic. So again, thank you all uh, very much. And I think with that introduction, we'll begin with Dr. Sudan, who's going to talk the tips and tricks of Roux-en-Y gastric uh, bypass. Uh, so again, uh, thanks very much, Rajan. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you very much, Keith. And thank you for all the uh, audience who's on the webinar. So I'm primarily going to be talking about the EEA anastomosis, or the circular stapler anastomosis, because that is what I do, and that is where I feel I can share my uh, tips and tricks with you. But uh, certainly, I'm sure if you've got other questions uh, regarding other types of techniques, some of the other authors might be able to help with that. Uh, and I'll try my best to answer any questions at the end of the discussion at the discussion period if you should have questions regarding that. So what I wanted to do is begin with this first slide that shows what is some of the common equipment that I use. I use two 12 millimeter ports, three five millimeter ports, and these are clear for optical entry. I use a five millimeter zero degree scope, and this allows me to get into the abdomen after I've established pneumoperitoneum with a, a varus or a step needle. And then for the rest of the operation, I use a 30-degree camera. I use the Nathanson liver retractor. There are certain, certainly other types of liver retractors that you can use, but this has just been something that I've used. I want to introduce you to this clamp. It's called the Dennis clamp, and it's a straight clamp, and I'll show you some pictures of it along the way. And this, I think, is a really nice clamp. It's long enough to be able to actually create the path for the entrance for the Nathanson liver retractor. And uh, I also use this clamp to help dilate the track for the EEA stapler. So it's, it's a straight clamp. It's actually a ball clamp. And it has enough strength to it. And it's a really good clamp for these purposes. In terms of staplers, I use the tan loads. Or you can use the equivalent. The tan loads are made by Covidian. But you can certainly use the equi equivalent uh, Ethicon stapler loads. I use the harmonic scalpel. But that's my preference. You can use any other. Uh, uh, electrical device that you feel like using. For the EEA stapler, I use the size 21 Orville. I know this is uh, somewhat debatable. Some people like to use a 25 Orville. And if there are questions related to that, we can certainly answer. And I can tell you why my preference is to use a 21 stapler. And I use the Orville, which basically means that it is deployed uh, orally uh, down the esophagus and into the stomach. I use a disposable cone for the insertion of the EEA stapler. And I think this really facilitates the insertion of the stapler. Um, and uh, I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, in terms of closing enterotomies, I use a, a absorbable suture. And this is a barbed suture so that it's actually pretty easy to uh, kind of uh, use. It has good amount of memory in it, but I think it also prevents slippage. And I think when we are, we are working with trainees in particular, I think the suture really helps there. Um, and for the mesenteric closure, I use a similar barbed non-absorbable suture. I do still use an inflatable balloon for sizing purposes. Um, I'll show you that balloon. This is made by the lap band people. And I use it not because I don't know what 30 cc's is, but I think uh, because we work with trainees, it sort of gives them a nice visual as to what a 30cc 
stomach pouch should look like. So I'm going to begin with my uh, with the uh, ports and let me see. The first port that goes in is certainly the camera port and that is just about 15 centimeters down from the xiphoid and about 5 centimeters to the left of the midline. And this gives a nice look at the hiatus and it seems to work really well. The other port, which is this white port, uh, which is right here and it's in the same line, is for the EEA stapler and this is in the left anterior axillary line roughly. I actually position this port so that it won't be uh, close to the left colon and it's sort of where the fat inside the belly and the muscle come together. Uh, then I use a 5 millimeter port which is here. I use another 5 millimeter port that is right subcostal in about the uh, mid clavicular line and then this green port is a 12 millimeter port through which the stapler is deployed, which is the linear cutter stapler for dividing the bowel and creating the jejunostomy. So that's my port configuration. The Nathanson liver retractor uh, doesn't is not through a port. It's a direct entry, um, and I make that entry using the Dennis clamp that I'm going to show you some pictures of. I'm actually not going to be showing you a video of this procedure, but uh, several photographs. And I think these photographs will actually take you through the procedure step by step. I particularly uh, think that that is going to be helpful. The, I'm not sure of the quality of the streaming video, so I think this is actually going to work out very well. So here are the steps of the laparoscopic ruin wine gastric bypass, and I'll uh, talk through the steps pretty much as though I'm talking to one of my fellows through this case. So the first thing that I do is I elevate the uh, the transverse mesocolon. So this right here is the transverse mesocolon. And the assistant actually shows uh, the ligament of trites in such a way, and I kind of uh, make the, the comparison, it's kind of like elevating the transverse mesocolon like a bullfighter would sort of elevate the curtain for the bull. So you do that and then the assistant can identify the ligament of trites, which is right here and then the bowel is measured 50 centimeters and in order to do that the bowel is actually rotated clockwise so this is the this would be the left hand of the of the surgeon the right hand of the surgeon and they rotate the bowel clockwise kind of in the manner that i just showed with the cursor and we measure off 50 centimeters in that direction the next thing that i do is i actually divide the bowel using a linear cutter stapler and one of the things that you will notice is I don't divide the mesentery of the small bowel. I think um, uh, you know some people like to divide that mesentery because of greater mobility. Using the EEA technique I've hardly ever had to divide the mesentery and I don't think the anastomoses are in particularly high amount of tension. The benefit of not dividing the mesentery is the chances of making either end of the bowel, either end of the bowel ischemic is actually pretty low um, and this seems to work just fine. So there's technically no division of the mesentery with this particular technique. The next thing that I do, um, and it looks a little bit more stretched out, but that's you know where we fired the stapler, I undercut the mesentery on the rule limb side. So right here, this is the proximal bowel, that will be the biliary limb. And this right here is going to be the rule limb or the distal staple line uh, of that first firing of the stapler that I just showed you. I undercut the, the mesentery just underneath this bowel because in a later step when we actually uh, fire the EES stapler and close the mesentery, we will resect this part of the bowel. By undercutting the mesentery here, I'm actually preventing bleeding because when you fire a stapler across the mesentery and the bowel, it doesn't seem to cinch the mesentery very well. And so you can get some bleeding on these edges. And undercutting the mesentery here, I think, really helps prevent that. Following that, we actually will rotate the bowel counterclockwise. And so this is the surgeon's right hand, the, sur uh, the uh, surgeon's left hand. And the bowel actually is rotated counterclockwise and I measure off 150 centimeters. 
I use 150 centimeters because um, that's the maximum that is allowed by the particular code that we use for insurance purposes, or the CPT code that's used for this particular procedure. Um, and I really don't know how to figure out whether a patient should have an 80 centimeter or 100 centimeter or 150 centimeter rule. And so I don't base this on BMI. I just use a standard 150 centimeter rule. And so once that is done, and this uh, this is a distended colon for some reason this patient had actually, and probably in the anesthetic process, got a fair amount of bagging and had a pretty distended colon and small bowel. As you can see, the small bowel is pretty distended as well. But the assistant holds uh, the bowel in position, and the surgeon puts traction on the left side. And then using the harmonic scalpel, we make a pinpoint hole and just expand it enough for the stapler to be inserted. So this is um, on the biliary limb side. We first make an enterotomy, and then we'll make a corresponding enterotomy on the rule limb side. So this just shows uh, the enterotomy being made. The next step is certainly after we made the uh, enterotomies is the uh, linear cutter stapled jejunal jejunostomy. The stapler is being inserted first on the biliary limb side and then subsequently on the uh, rule limb side and a size 60 stapler is used for this purpose. And that shows um, that's the biliary limb that's the rule limb, and again, the enterotomies are made just small enough for the stapler to be inserted. This actually makes the closure of the enterotomy uh, more efficient when you're using a suture technique. If you're using a stapler technique, certainly it'll prevent you from narrowing the bowel down. So that uh, shows you the stapler, and when, when you're removing the stapler, one of the precautions that we use is we don't, um, I, I sort of half open the stapler to allow it to slide out, and then I close the stapler back down again, and that prevents the jaws of the stapler from springing open and making this enterotomy very wide. Following this, we use a suture technique, and this I'm using absorbable sutures. As you can see, these have some barbs on them. This is uh, the Covidian version of it, but there's certainly other versions that you can use. Um, and then the enterotomy is just basically sutured shut. You can, for those institutions or those surgeons who like to use the endostitch, you can use the endostitch for this purpose, or there's a free needle version that is available, and you can free needle it closed. You can certainly use the stapler as well to close this enterotomy if that's your preference. Following the uh, jejunal jejunostomy, I just leave that sit in the lower abdomen. The patient is positioned in a pretty severe reverse trend Ellenberg. And this is the dentist clamp that I was talking about. It's a straight clamp. It goes in and it allows uh, the tract to be dilated. As you know, the Nathanson liver, liver retractor has a straight portion. And if you don't get that uh, tract perfectly straight, sometimes you can have trouble inserting the Nathanson liver retractor. I think this creates a, is a, creates a straight path and really facilitates the deployment of the Nathanson liver retractor. Uh, the liver has now been elevated using the Nathanson liver retractor, and this is the straight portion of the Nathanson liver retractor that I was talking about. The next step uh, that uh, we, we use is this shows the inflated balloon. This is a 30 cc pouch and it really tells you uh, where you need to make your uh, pouch. We sort of create a window right here on the gastrohepatic ligament. I do a vagal sparing and a blood vessel sparing approach so I will actually make my tunnel inside here. Um, this is the rest of the tube and this tube can actually be used both for um, insufflation of methylene blue should you choose to test it that way or air if you don't have access to endoscopy or you can certainly use the endoscope uh, for leak testing down the road. Just as a side note, I use this tube also for using, uh, for sizing my sleeve gastrectomies and I also use this for when I do the duodenal switch and I want to test the sleeve and the anastomosis with methylene blue. 
because it has a, a port that basically allows me to do that. So I use this as my standard equipment in my bariatric procedures. The next step is really creating the tunnel. This is created into the lesser sac. And again, this is very close to the stomach. In order to, to create this tunnel, uh, I make a little window into the uh, peritoneum, which is on the gastrohepatic ligament. So this would be kind of how I would create the uh, little window in the peritoneum. And then I use essentially a dilating, you know, sequential dilating maneuver with my Debakey grasper on the left hand and the harmonic on the right, and if I encounter any blood vessels, I'll, count, I'll cauterize them or I'll control them with the harmonic, but otherwise I create this tunnel. Once the tunnel is created, I leave the Debakey in the retrogastric tunnel, and then I'll actually slide my stapler along the Debakey grasper and fire the first load. So the first load actually comes from the patient's right side. This shows the deployment of the stapler. I'm using a size 60 stapler, but really I only use about 45 millimeters of that staple length for that first load. Uh, one of the tricks that I use is there's a black line on the stapler, and the second and the third staple load actually come from the patient's left side. So I figure out where this line, black line, would actually line up with the angle of his and that seems like it would be a good path for that stapler to fire that's coming down from my other 12 millimeter port, uh, which I showed in the beginning, and that's in the left anterior axillary area. So that's how I decide how long I want to make this pouch. You want this to be uh, kind of long enough to, so that you've got a landing zone for the EEA stapler, and one way I ensure that I have a fairly horizontal line is I articulate the or I angle the stapler uh, down towards the foot to be sure I've got a good um, uh, I've got a good angle at that. So the next couple of firings actually come from the patient's left side, and this keeps both the assistant uh, and the surgeon pretty involved. And a couple of firings you'll see will essentially. Uh, complete the division. I then use my stapler to ensure uh, just by a little bit of sideward traction that the staple line has been completely formed and the pouch has been divided from the remnant stomach completely. And also I check for bleeding at this stage. You can certainly use staple line reinforcements. It's my preference not to because overall, as you can see, the staple lines are pretty hemostatic using this particular load of the stapler. Um, and uh, I, I don't like the staple line reinforcements getting caught in my EEA stapler firing. So, uh, but if you choose to use it, that would be fine as well. Once the stomach pouch has been created, the next step is actually passing the Orville down. And one of the steps, and I hope this is being projected well, is to actually pass the Orville down until the tip of the NG tube is sort of indenting the stomach. The assistant actually traps the NG tube from one side, or the, this is the NG tube, or the, actually it's not the NG tube, I'm sorry, it's the orogastric portion of the Orville. And the surgeon traps it from uh, the, the other side. And this prevents the tube from slipping out of position. This is very important when you're doing the Orville approach, because if this tube slips out of position after you made your enteronomy, it can be quite frustrating, and you actually don't uh, want to spend a lot of time doing that. So uh, by trapping this tube in place, the next step is just bringing the harmonic scalpel. I position the heart blade right on top of where that uh, previous indentation was and make the opening about the size of the blade. And then I'll take a little pinch uh, of tissue, just enough for the uh, tube to come out. I'll show you that in the next slide. So this shows the tube actually is coming out. We bring the tube out, and uh, assistant braces the stomach while the surgeon actually pulls this out of the left side. One key here is the EEA21, at least the one that's made by Covidian, is sky blue. 
and that's important to note because they also make a 25 and you want to make sure before your uh, assistant or the anesthesiologist inserts the Orville that your Orville is matched to your stapler because it's happened to us where the anvil and the stapler were mismatched and that creates a real disaster because the, the staple lines don't hold very well. Once the Orville is in position, you cut one of these strings, you pull on the other, and that will allow the tube to come detached from the uh, Orville itself. So the Orville is sitting in here, and this is uh, the part that will engage with the stapler. This is the cone that I was showing you. The cone actually helps in insertion. You just get the cone in and ease the stapler inside the abdomen. You then get rid of this cone, and after that, you engage uh, the stapler. Uh, before, before engaging the stapler, what you'll do is make an enterotomy in the staple edge of the rulem. And so this shows that we're making that uh, enterotomy. I then grab the enterotomy at the 2 o'clock and the 11 o'clock position. This is the mesentery, so this gives you a three-point kind of attachment, and the stapler which is an EA21 stapler, is inserted into the bowel. I covered the entire white portion of the stapler because that seems to be the adequate amount of length to be able to form the anastomosis and then close the enterotomy without leaving a big candy cane. So that is the next step. You engage the stapler. You have to be sure, at least on this particular brand, that this orange line is completely within the anvil itself, and it's going to, you actually hear an audible click. The anastomosis is then formed. It's a nice small pouch. And then I don't put, use any particular uh, bags or pr wound protectors, etc. You can certainly use that. What I do is I just suction out and irrigate the, uh, the stapler itself, and that cleans it adequately to prevent wound infections. In order to close the enterotomy, we we elevate the bowel both at the 12 o'clock and the 6 o'clock position. The stapler is uh, angulated upwards about two clicks or about 45 degrees, and that allows you to fire the stapler and close the enterotomy. That piece of the bowel is then retrieved. I put a stitch between the remnant stomach and the rulem. I think part of this is to prevent torsion. Some of the surgeons do that. And part of it is it sort of elevates the rulem in such a way that you can then close the mesentery pretty easily. And this last slide shows that we are closing the mesenteric uh, kind of attachments between the biliary limb and the rulem using a non-absorbable suture. This is a long uh, closure that starts somewhere down here and comes all the way between the two loops of bowel. Uh, and we finish up by doing an endoscopic leak test that just shows uh, a suction uh, irrigator uh, submerging the anastomosis, and through an endoscopic uh, uh, insufflation of air, we check and make sure that the anastomosis is uh, uh, airtight. Uh, that will complete my presentation, and then certainly uh, I'll be happy to take any questions or whatever Dr. Gerson wants to do next. Oh, thanks very much, Rajan. Very nice uh, presentation.